I'm going to do a little bit of setup before we read our scripture passage. Like last week, I think a little bit of setting this up will be helpful. You know, there's a, obviously there's always a larger context whenever we read a portion of scripture. Now, uh, we talked about this a little bit last week. What Paul had written in Romans chapters 1 through 8, what he wrote there, we're on, we're on chapter 9 now, what he wrote in 1 through 8 could be described in sort of a broad general way as, this is very... This is very broad, but it's kind of teaching about salvation and teaching about justification by faith in Jesus. For many of the people, see that doesn't sound that strange to us, but for many people in the day and age that this was written, to the, the audiences that that would have gone to at this time, uh, this would have raised a question. Everything that he wrote in chapters 1 through 8 probably would have raised a question in the minds of some people. That question would have been, hey, wait a minute, Paul, well, hey, wait. All this stuff you just wrote here? What about the Jewish people? What, what is, how does this apply there? And it's obvious that Paul anticipates. He, he understands that people are going to have that question because now we're working our way through chapters 9, 10, and 11, and Paul is dealing with that. He's basically sort of answering the question, what about the Jewish people? One of the points that comes up in chapter 9 is it's very important to understand, and it's, a, it's a really a, a very critical detail. And this would have been something, well, I'll read it to you in just a minute here. This would have been something that would have been very controversial to people in Paul's time, especially Jewish people. This would have been, I, I probably can't even, I probably can't even put into words how controversial this would have been to their ears. So here's, this is in chapter 9, verse 6. Paul says this, this is in the text. This is not me. This is what Paul says. Paul writes, Not all the people born into the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. That loud gasp that you just heard, that was people thousands of years ago in Paul's day because they're still flabbergasted by it. They're still gasping from that statement. Again, it doesn't, I know it doesn't hit our ears quite as strongly, but in those days, what Paul wrote there would have been by you no good. Put up your dukes. Let's go. Those would have been fighting words. We're going to it. Let's go. I'm going to read from a commentary that I referenced this week. This is a commentary. It's written by a man named, uh, a scholar named William Barclay. It's a commentary on the book of Romans, and he's dealing with this section of Scripture. He says, this is, Barclay says, this commentator, the real chosen people never lay in the whole nation. He's talking about the nation of Israel. It never lay there. It always lay in the righteous remnant. That's italicized in this commentary. The few, this is still Barclay, the few who were true to God when all others denied him. It was so in the days of Elijah, when 7,000 remained faithful to God after the rest of the nation had strayed and followed Baal. It was an essential part of the teaching of Israel, or of Isaiah, who said, Though the, the number of the children of Israel are like the sand on the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Still reading from Barclay. Paul's point is that at no time were the whole people the chosen people. There was always selection, election, he says, on the part of God. So Paul's given this answer. Well, what about the Jewish people? Hold on. What about God's chosen people? And he makes a point here that would have upset many people. This would have, this would have been, I'm telling you, this would have been fighting words. For the, they, there would have been a gasp. The Danier types would have fainted straight away. Remember, we said last week, I said, that there were people, in, Jewish people in Paul's day, who at this point in time, they considered him to be a traitor to the Jew. He's a traitor to the Jewish people. It's things like this that would have prompted them to say that. That no good Paul. He used to be a good guy. Now he's a bad guy. But Paul is writing words that are true. They're written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So, having, having written these words that we read in Romans chapter 9, verse 6, about the, you know, they're not all, not all of them. It's, it's just a selection of them. Paul then anticipates another follow-up question. He knows, well, that's going to generate a question. And the follow-up question that somebody probably would have asked to Romans chapter 9, verse 6 is this. Well, then hold on a minute. 
Isn't God being unfair then to the Jewish people? God's being unfair to the Jewish people, right? And Paul says, I'm paraphrasing, no. No, of course not. He's not unfair. Why isn't that unfair, Paul? And here's Paul's basic answer. Because God can do whatever he wants to do. He's God. Anybody here ever try to beat up God? It doesn't work, right? I know that doesn't sound like that, that doesn't sound like a real nice gentle, but that's what he says, basically. So now, with that set up, let's take the Bible that's in front of you there, and your body there, and turn to Romans chapter 9. And we're going to start now at verse 16. I gave a little bit of a lead into that. And Paul is going to... This is not the easiest passage of Scripture, I'll be honest with you. Paul's going to throw down a little bit here. Romans chapter 9. We're going to start at verse 16. If you haven't, say yes. Okay. So you know, God can show mercy to whoever he wants to. Paul, Paul goes in, in verse 16. He says, so it is... God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I've appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to some and he chooses to harden the hearts of others so they refuse to listen. Wow. Verse 19, well, then you might say, well, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? Here's Paul's response to that. No, no, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have a right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw the garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he's very patient with those on whom his anger falls who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter to those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for glory. And we are among those whom he selected. Thank you, Lord. Both from the Jews and, here we go again, from the, well, who? The Gentiles. That's the people who are not Jewish. Once again, what? What's he saying? What's going on here? Now, these verses that we just read here, you're probably going, wow, what in the world? These passages um, help to contribute to a long-standing debate, a long-standing issue within theology, and really even within the field of philosophy. The issue could be described as predestination versus free will. Predestination. Does God just simply predetermine everything? He just sets it all in motion and has been predetermined. He makes all the choices. He arranges everything so that it all happens the way he decides it's going to happen in advance predestination or do we human beings have some kind of a role do we have some kind of free will there's this debate it's been going on for a long time now I'll tell you something if the only verses in the Bible that address that subject if the only verses that we could look at that have to do with that debate were the ones that we just now read I would be inclined to say it kind of looks like you and I don't have free will right that doesn't look like a free will situation there. It's just all predetermined by God. That would be a pretty understandable conclusion if those were the only verses that we had to go on, but they're not. Again, this is a long-standing debate. How does something get to be a long, long, long-standing debate? It's because it's not easily settled. It's a long-standing debate because it hasn't been settled yet, because there's good arguments on both sides. For example... Um, there are passages that make it pretty clear that we do have some choice. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus describes himself in this, in this verse, he describes himself as standing at the door and knocking. He's talking about like basically the door of our hearts. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. And here's what it says. If you hear my voice, if, conditional, if you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. That's right. You can open the door. You don't have to. Or you can. 
But again, it's presented, that's presented as it's a choice on our part. It's presented in a way that indicates, well, we choose to respond or not respond. We don't have to, it's conditional. If you hear, I looked at a whole bunch of translations uh, um, yesterday. I want to see, is that word if in every single one of them? It's in every single one, if. If you hear my voice and open the door, we appear to have a choice in the matter. Second Peter, there's an, uh, I'm just giving you a couple of passages to see like there's another side to this. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, we're told, this is what it says, God wants everybody to come to repentance. That's God's will. He wants everybody to come to repentance, to turn to Him. Well, if it was all predetermined by God, then everyone, then everyone would be saved. Because that's His will. He makes it clear that's His will. Mm -hmm. So then everybody would be saved. But we know from the Bible, it's very clear, not everybody's going to turn to God. Not everybody's going to be saved. So this indicates, again, there's some kind of a response on our part. In fact, the passage that we looked at that would be the classic passage to determine, uh, you know, the, to, to make a case for predestination, even there it talks about God having patience, giving people time. These things kind of indicate that we have a choice. You don't need to be patient if you just speak the word and it's taken care of. Patience is only needed if you're going to give people, someone time to, to respond. There are other verses that point to free will too. I'm just, I'm just trying to give you a, a little bit of, a, of an understanding that there's two sides. Are you getting that? Yes. There's two sides to this debate. I'm not going to be able, I won't, I won't be able to put the debate to bed this morning. I know you were hoping. In Oaklawn, Illinois, on December 11th, Dan Marler was going to end this thousands and thousands of years of debate, and Dan was going to put it to bed. And I'd like to, but I just don't think you folks are ready for it. No. <laughs> I can't, I'm not able to do that. Um, so, yet we ask this question, is God sovereign and he's in complete control? And the answer is, yes, he is. Yes. yes. Yep. Yes, he is. However, is it also true that we have a choice and we can choose to respond to God? We can choose to turn to Him. Is that true? Yes. 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 You say, well, how do you resolve those two statements, Dan? I don't know. I've read attempts in theology books to, to resolve it, but here's what, here, I, I, I don't even, I, I'm not going to try to resolve it. Here's what I want to do. I want to I assure you of this. Because if, if there's anybody sitting here going, gee, I want to turn to God. Am I, is that available to me? I, I want you to know this. If you want to know God, I, yeah, I want to know. If you want to turn to God and be saved, <clears throat> do that. Look to, I mean, like in this moment, right now, you got permission to stop listening to me for a moment and just look to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge you as Lord. Mm. I acknowledge you as Savior. Look to Jesus. You can do that right now. Put your faith, not in you. Put your trust, not in you. Put it in Jesus. Don't worry about theological debates that have been going on. This debate will still be going. If the, if the world goes on another 2,000 years, this debate will still be going. Don't worry about that. You personally, right now, if you're inclined to do that, if the Holy Spirit is moving in you right now, Respond to Jesus. <clears throat> Say yes. Yes, Jesus. I want you. Yes. Next week, we're going to actually be reading in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. I'll give you a little preview of that. Here's what that verse says. This is real good news. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, so if you say, he's the Lord, I'm not, he is, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He's alive. He's not dead. He's a living Jesus Christ. You will be saved. Let me read it again. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can choose to put your faith and trust in Jesus right now. And if you do, you will, not you might, not maybe, you will be saved. Yes? Yes. Good news. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes? Yes. Yes. Merry Christmas, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Now, let's keep in mind that part of what Paul is doing here is he's really, again, by the nature of how he lays this out, he's kind of addressing questions, concerns, maybe even in a certain sense, misunderstandings that would happen based on what he has presented. 
He's anticipating, perhaps, objections, questions. He's anticipating the possibility that there may be some people who genuinely are puzzled. Like, they're really puzzled by what they're reading here. Like, what's going on, Paul? What are you saying here? There would be people who would have read this and said, not all people born into the nation of Israel are God's people? What? What? And so it's in that context now that Paul kind of comes in and he gives, it's really sort of a fundamental lesson regarding the sovereignty of God. It's God's nature. But really, in a way, it's like Paul starts to throw down. That's right. And that's, that's how I, you know, that's the uh, you know, old school way of saying it. He's throwing down. Paul says, God can decide to show mercy to whoever he wants to show mercy to. You're going to stop him? And people are going, well, I guess not. Paul quotes Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, what we would call the Old Testament. They're, they're scriptures. In other words, he's telling them, he's quoting Exodus. He's saying, this isn't something new. This is, this is not some new thing here. That's how it's always been. With, he says, this is what God told Moses. Remember our, our guy Moses? See, it's almost as if somebody was asking, hey, since when did God think he could start showing mercy to the Gentiles? Since when did he think he could do that kind of stuff? And the answer is, hey, he's God. He doesn't need your permission. He makes the determinations about who receives his mercy. And then Paul takes it a little further, and he gives us this analogy. Do we have choruses that we sing that use this analogy? Thou art the potter and I am the clay. He said, Paul says, here, think about it like this. God's the potter, and you're clay. That's the analogy he sets up. Is the clay, I spin it on this wheel, is the clay going to start questioning the potter and tell the potter what's going on? Hey, potter, I, I think you're making some mistakes here. No, it doesn't work like that. The clay's not on the same level as the potter. They're not the same. They don't have the same power. The clay doesn't have authority like the potter. There's only one of these two. There's a potter and there's clay. One is the creator. The other is the created. But you hear this kind of stuff and you might be inclined to say, well, then I guess I'm just a big lump of nothing. I guess I have no worth or I, just, I guess I'm a nobody. And that's not correct. That's not true either. God loves us. He really does. Hey, we're made, we alone, of everything that God created, only you and I, only human beings are made in his image. Only us. Jesus came and died. It's Christmas. Jesus came to earth. Why? To, he's going to die for us. We have value and dignity. Thank you, Lord. Yes? yes. Thank you, Lord, because we have the value and dignity because of God. That's why we have it. So that's good and it's true. But what Paul's doing here is he's reminding us, however, we're not equals with God. The power, the authority, this like complete and total knowledge of everything, this is immeasurably more than you and I. We, that's not us. You don't know everything. You don't even know a tiny fraction of everything. In terms of abilities and strength and knowledge, it's not like here's God and we're just a little bit lower than him. No, there's a vast, vast, immeasurable difference between us and him. He's way, way, way beyond us. It's not close. Sometimes the way I think of it is like this. Like the difference between us and God. And this doesn't completely cover it, but think about it like this. There was a time, it was very long ago, but there was a time when God spoke and everything came into existence out of nothing. Like there weren't molecules and chaotic matter floating around. There was nothing. There was nothing. There weren't planets and stars. Well, there were some cells. And no, there was nothing. Nothing existed. Nothing. And God spoke and everything came into existence. Everything. Do you have power like that? No. No. It's, a, it's, a, it's an unimaginable power. So somebody thinks they're going to tell God what's going on. What he's, here's what you got to do now, God. They're going to correct God. They're going to straighten him out. And Paul's saying, no, it doesn't work like that. Here, you know what you do before the majesty and power of God? You know what a good move is? Here's what, here's what you do before the power and majesty of God. You bow down on your knees and you humbly cry out, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. 
That's a real good move. That's, somebody in the Bible did that. It was a good idea to do that. And you know what? Here's, here's the amazing thing. <laughs> you want to know something wonderful? If you humbly come before the Lord and you say, please have mercy on someone like me, he will have mercy on you. Don't you want some mercy? I bet you need mercy. Mercy is, here's what you deserve. This is what you actually deserve. And I'm going to give you something way better than what you deserve. Life. Don't you want mercy? Yes. Yeah, say yes. <laughs> so here's the deal. We're, we're, we're works in progress. We're, we're growing. The more we understand as we grow, it, the more we understand the truth about God, the more we grasp who he is, the more inclined we are then to worship him. The, like the more you understand him, the more inclined you are to worship him, to exalt him, to see him worthy of praise. In our texts, there are references to God's glory. And it's talking about like God exercising his authority when it comes to his anger and his mercy. And it says this, he, God, does this. He's exercising, he's showing his glory to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter. When God's power and control and, and so sovereignty and his supremacy are seen, when God's power like that is demonstrated and people really get it, it inspires worship. God is glorified. I'll say it again, the more that you, and we grow, this is a process of growth, the more you and I know and understand the truth of God, the more that we see him for who he really is, the more accurately we perceive and we recognize that's God, that's God, the more inclined we are then to go down on our knees and worship and exalt him. I've heard people say before, and I know it can kind of seem like, well, maybe God's improperly arrogant when it comes to his, he's always want to be glorified and worshiped and honored. That's an arrogant position, isn't it? Try to understand and remember this. This is an important thing to understand. It's actually impossible for God to be arrogant. It's impossible. Because arrogance involves a misunderstanding. A person who's arrogant is incorrect. God's not incorrect. Arro arrogance involves an overestimation of the self. God does not overestimate himself. Actually, arrogance, I went and looked up the definition of arrogance. Now, let me get a real, and it says arrogance is having an undue degree of your own importance, an undue degree of your thinking way highly of yourself. God can't do that because he can't be overestimated. His importance can't be, he can be underestimated to people's, um, it's not good for him to, to do that. But that's possible. He can be underestimated, but he can't be overestimated because he really is supreme. He's more supreme than we realize. Like whatever grand and glorious things we could say about God, he's more than that. He's more than that. When God makes his own glory known, actually all he's doing then is just making the truth known. If God says... If God displays his glory and, and, and uh, expects us to worship him, he's actually just being factually accurate. That's exactly what should happen. He is glorious. Amen. See, if I seek to be worshipped, if I seek to be glorified, that's wrong. It's improper. It's not right for me to be worshipped. I'm not deserving of that. When God expects us to glorify him and worship him, it's proper, it's right, it is totally reasonable. He is completely deserving of praise and glory and worship and exaltation. He deserves that. There is a God, there is a Supreme One, he's all powerful. There is no one like him. Do you recognize that? Yes. Yeah. I'm not God. And you're not God. He's above us. Matter of fact, you want to have hope? Say yes. yes. <laughs> All hope is found in Him. That's where our hope is found. Are you willing to give Him the honor and the praise that He deserves? Will you do that? Let's do that together. Yes. yes? As a church. Yes. As brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please? That's John right there. He loves to pray for people. 
And uh, he's usually up here right at the end of the service. And he, if you'll come forward and you want somebody to pray with you, John will do that. There's Rose over there. She loves to pray for people too. They have a gift for intercessory prayer. And uh, if you have any kind of a need that you would like to be prayed for, Come on up. When I'm done praying, you can come on up. Or even while I'm praying, you can come up. And uh, these folks would be more than happy. They would love to pray for you. Next week, we're going to keep going. We're going to be in Romans chapter 10. Oh, and a great passage of Scripture. It's, it based, I, I read a portion of it already this morning. Call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Amen. We'll be talking about yes. that. That's going to be a perfect setup for it because the next Sunday following that is Christmas. Ah, perfect. Uh, isn't Jesus good? Amen. 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 Bow your heads, if you would please. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for showing mercy to us. So many things we don't understand. Difficult passages of Scripture sometimes that we go, boy, what? But you love us and you care for us. Lord, I pray that any person who's listening to me right now who, who wants to know you, who wants salvation, I pray that they would turn to you in this moment and cry out to you for salvation, that they would put their faith and their trust in you. Lord, it's a, it's a time of year when I think maybe there might be a little bit more openness, a little bit more awareness of Jesus. And so maybe there are some opportunities that will come our way to be agents for you, to be your ambassadors. Holy Spirit, stir in us, make us, give us awareness, give us sensitivity if there are opportunities that we have to bring the truth of who you are. Help us to move, help us to respond. May you be glorified and honored. I pray for your blessing upon every single person in this room, every person who's watching online. Bless them. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless. Amen. Have a good week. Would you do me a favor? Would you please like and share this video and subscribe to this channel? That will help us be more effective at spreading the good news.